the data in our business is generally, if you can keep a tenant for about 16 months, they'll stay for about three years. Once they get in and it's like a gym membership and they're on auto pay and they just kind of like, ah, it's a hundred bucks a month. I don't really care. And eventually something's like, they forget what's in there or they go see it one day and they're like, why am I keeping all this stuff? But you know, it's an interesting business plan in that we're just kind of, we get forgotten because it's a small percentage of your overall income as a, as a percent or, you know, the rent is a small percentage of your overall income. Are you a real estate syndicator or professional who is looking to grow your business in 2023? Are you tired of attending networking meetup after meetup and thinking that there has to be a better way? Have you ever thought about podcast guesting? According to Statista, podcasts are going to reach over 100 million listeners by 2024. Podcast guesting allows you to tap into that network of listeners. At Podcasting U, they have worked with hundreds of investors to secure guest placements on thousands of podcasts so they can raise more capital, generate brand awareness, and increase their credibility. If you're interested in learning how podcast guesting can help grow your real estate business in 2023, go to podcastingu.com forward slash syndication to book your free discovery call. This is your daily real estate syndication show. If you are watching this, you'll notice that I'm recording from a different studio today. And I just think, man, this is a, a great example of why we push hard as entrepreneurs and in, in real estate and uh, other businesses as well. Uh, you know, I'm able to travel and work in other places. I'm in a in a friend's studio right now in their office, and and uh, you know, while my family is getting to enjoy the beach, so you know, I am still working while they're at the beach, but I, I won't be here all the time. Uh, but it just, man, I just want to encourage you if you're still grinding it out, keep going. Right, this business and being an entrepreneur is so worth it, uh, and being able to make your own schedule and work from anywhere. So I, I want to jump into today's show. A guest that we have on today is he's. A repeat guest. It's been a few years ago, though. Man, I've seen him grow. I've seen their business grow. His name is Chris Benson. He's the chief investment officer for Reliant Real Estate Management, the 17th largest self-storage operator in the U.S. in 2022. In the last 18 months, Reliant Team has invested over $400 million in self-storage projects and raised over $200 million in equity, primarily from a substantial real retail investor network. Reliant is currently raising equity for a $100 million equity fund closing on value add and, and stabilize self-storage assets across the U.S. Chris dives into a number of things today, but we're going to go over some overview of the self-storage industry, some market analysis, some best practices, and really ways that, you know, as a passive investor, you need to know that that operator that you're investing with, not only are they a great operator, of course, and it may hopefully you have built a great relationship with them, but are they maximizing return on investment? Do they? What strategies are they using? What What's their niche? What type of projects are they looking for to ensure they're maximizing uh, you know, that return on, on investment? And you're going to hear that from Chris today. I know many of our listeners are loving self-storage. They've been focusing on self-storage in their uh, businesses for a long time now. But our guest today is an expert in that space, working for a, a company that I've learned more about recently and, and have come to respect in a great way. Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks, Whitney. Appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, honored to have you on again. Chris was a guest a few years ago. I mean, their business, Reliant, ha has grown and he has been heading that charge there uh, in a massive way. Uh, and so, Chris, give us an update. Give us, you know, maybe a brief version of your path to real estate, but let's dive into what's, you know, happening at Reliant and then we'll dive into even some of the you know, uh, the industry itself and just what you all see happening. Uh, sure. Uh, which one do you want to start with? You want to start with my path to real estate? or Yeah, yeah. give us a little bit about your path and then let's dive into self-storage specifically. Yeah, for sure. So my background, Whitney, is from a career standpoint, I started my career in sales. My last real job, I guess, was with a company called Intuitive Surgical. I sold uh, the Da Vinci robot kind of all over the East Coast, which was a, a fun adventure, incredible technology. And I got into real estate probably not too dissimilarly than a lot of people did. When I was about 30, I said, I don't think I can do this for another 30 years. And I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And the idea of passive income and creating uh, wealth through passive income was sort of a, a new idea for me. And so my wife and I started with some residential units in the town that we lived in. 
probably not too dissimilar than than most people who are listening to this. So we did that for a while. I hated every minute of it. We we had about 20 <laughs> units and it just wasn't scalable for what I wanted to do. It, it was the people that were the problem, not necessarily like maintenance, that kind of thing. It was just soul sucking. I, I the, the tenants always seemed to have a problem and I was mired in day-to-day stuff that I just didn't want to be. So uh, we ended up going a little bit larger, got into some larger multifamily, cutting a long story short, but we ended up building a 64-unit apartment complex. And that was sort of the light bulb for me where I said, oh, this is how you make money in real estate at a, a larger scale. There's a great quote, Whitney, that is big deals and small deals are the same amount of work. You just make less money on small deals. And it's so true, right? You, you spend the same amount of time, whether you're buying a duplex or a 300-unit apartment complex, you just make less money on the duplex. So... <laughs> I think that was kind of the guiding light for me. We did a bunch of multifamily stuff, uh, both as an active investor and as a passive investor. I, I started, I uncovered what a syndication was and did some investing um, of my own capital as a, a passive investor. And then about six years ago, I was interested in self storage as an asset class. I, I was convinced that cap rates and apartments couldn't possibly compress any further than they were at that moment. I was a little bit off on that few years, I, I was a few years off on my predictions. I'm not very good at telling the future. And so I wanted to get another asset class. And for me, it was mobile homes or self storage. And I'm leading to how I got to Reliant. I was an investor here first as an LP in, in one of their deals. And the managing partner, Todd Allen, who started and co-founded Reliant with uh, his partner, Lou Pollock, he and I had a, a great relationship. And he needed some help scaling and I joined the company about five years ago. So yeah, it's that that's how I got to here and happy to kind of take a break there before I continue to. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Your path to commercial real estate is similar. However, I'm surprised you didn't take a, a similar step that I did and become a professional horse trainer. Well, that wasn't in there anywhere. <laughs> no, <laughs> I have enough hobbies. None of them involve horses, although I do my own expensive habits too. Yeah, no, no I'm just kidding about that, of course. but. Man, uh, you know, you you saw the light, uh, you know, as far as the scaling component, it's interesting you talk about, you know, single family or duplex versus multifamily or, or large commercial. I, I completely agree. It's, it seems like a myth that I myself and many others believed at one time, right? We have to start with this and uh, it was single family and grow slowly. Man, not realizing that almost the same amount of work to do a, a much larger property, uh, you know, and, and scale much faster. But I want to dive into self-storage and, and the industry, just an overview of the industry. And, and maybe you can give us you know, some, some benefits. I'd love to focus on the current you know, economic climate, too, when we're talking about like benefits of investing or potential risks or uh, the th- factors that you know, the investors listening right now should be considering when thinking about self-storage. So let's do that. Why don't you give us just your overview of the industry as it stands today? And, and of course, you know, and this is the end of February uh, 2023, just so everybody knows that as, as Chris is talking about, you know, the industry uh, as a whole. And, and you know, it, let's dive in there. Maybe some benefits and potential risks. Let's uh, talk about, you know, as as it stands today. Yeah, I think just kind of high level overview on the industry. It's it's a super interesting asset class, right? Um, you know, 10 years ago, we were kind of the redheaded stepchild of real estate. The core four multifamily, industrial, office, retail have always been sort of the darlings of the real estate space. And I think, you know, after 2007, 8, and 9, the asset class self-storage performed really well. And so a lot of people started to take notice. And then I would say, you know, kind of 2012, 13, 14, it, it became a real thing. Institutional capital started deploying capital in the space. And, you know, it's, it's an interesting market. There's just from a scale standpoint, there's over 50,000 self-storage facilities in the U.S. One out of nine Americans have a storage facility, which is a mind-boggling statistic. And what's interesting, Whitney, is uh, the more storage there is, the more people use it. You know, five years ago, that was a one out of 12 American statistic. So more people are utilizing the asset class. And I think the question we all ask is, well, where does it end? You know, does does that usage continue? Does it just become a part of the American lexicon? And and that's the part I don't I don't really know. So, you know, as an asset class, super interesting. and, And what got me interested in it is it's still very fragmented. So, you know, for those of the listeners who are out there, maybe come from a private equity or venture capital space, the the asset class still has a lot of mom and pop operators. There's six publicly traded companies that, you know, five publicly traded REITs, groups like Public Storage, Extra Space, Cube Smart. If any of your listeners are in the car, 
just look off an exit ramp and there's a pretty good bet you'll see one of those sitting off any major highway. And then past those six publicly traded companies, it's very fragmented. Reliant is the 17th largest storage operator in the US. We have 85 properties. So we're not the biggest, but we're not the smallest. And about 50% of the square footage in the US is owned by operators who own less than five facilities. So there's still a lot of mom and pop operators in the space, which gives us a really nice consolidation play, right? I think if you think of us as an organization, the long-term goal is a roll-up strategy, right? We're going to continue to consolidate the mom and pops into a larger portfolio. And you know, generally, institutional capital is looking for that larger trade. For some of your listeners, they may have seen the last couple of weeks, public storage just made a uh, a bid for life storage. The, four, the number one tried to buy the number four, and it was a hostile bid takeover. And so what's happening is there's that consolidation in the market. And I think, you know, over the next 10 years, there's going to be a lot more of that. The big are going to get bigger as the mom and pop start to trade out. And, you know, it rolls into institutional capital. Same thing happened in multifamily, Whitney. If you go back 10, 20 years, all those multifamily operators, those mom and pops, it's much harder to find those guys and gals now. Uh, because there's been so much institutional capital in the space. Yeah, no doubt about it. Uh, that's it's interesting. You think about uh, one out of nine Americans have a self storage unit. That's that's a neat statistic to think about. That, but you said I think you said five years ago it was one out of twelve. I mean, we got a lot of stuff, don't we? <laughs> and we need to keep it, and we want to keep it, right? Uh, and I think there's a, there's even uh, you know some sentimental stuff probably there that ties them to those uh, self storage units uh, often, right? Uh, they want to keep those, and no matter what's happening, what do you see as far as potential risks? Uh, you know, as far as uh, the self storage industry, you know, a- as we see it right now, and I think about those one in nine families, what's going to cause you know, uh, you know, a certain percentage of those to to stop renting or stop paying, or you know, what what do you see happening? Uh, you know, as far as the economy, right, we'll dive into the economy, but, but I, I just mean specifically to those one out of nine. What's going to be the biggest thing that's going to tell them to, or make them stop paying? It's a fair question. I I don't know if I know the answer, right? So. What you're describing is sort of a a consumer sentiment shift. Are people going to stop consuming the asset class? I don't think so. But again, you know, stranger things have happened. I mean, you know, a disruption of that type would require people to stop buying things. And in America, that's a hard thing for us to understand. We're just a culture built on consumerism. And generally, we don't get rid of stuff, right? The data in our business is generally, if you can keep a tenant for about 16 months, they'll stay for about three years. Once they get in and it's like a gym membership and they're on auto pay and they just kind of like, ah, it's a hundred bucks a month. I don't really care. And eventually something's like, they forget what's in there or they go see it one day and they're like, why am I keeping all this stuff? But you know, it's an interesting business plan in that we're just kind of, we get forgotten because it's a small percentage of your overall income as a as a percent or you know the rent is a small percentage of your overall income. So to your question of what changes the market, I, I don't know. There's some things happening where you look at like the Airbnb model of self storage. There's a few startups where people are you know trying to test that model. UPS was talking about like a, a home delivery self storage where you put your stuff in bins. UPS comes and picks it up. They go put it in a warehouse somewhere. And then when you need it, they bring it back to your house. We talked to the guys that started that business. It's got some challenges. It's very expensive. It's hard to make money. But, you know, look, technology and things are going to continue to evolve and and we'll try to evolve with it. But I don't see anything on the horizon, at least Whitney, that suggests, hey, you know, people are going to stop consuming and stop renting the units. Yeah. Do you know... Like how many units are being built right now and just the demand and, and some of the market analysis or saturation saturation stuff that we could cover right now? Do you know some of that right off the top of your head where we could, the listener could just be more aware of the demand versus the growth and some of that? Yeah. I mean, it's very, you just hit on it. It's very market specific. So I don't know national statistics. Uh, I will say COVID put a, a big crimp in basically new supply being delivered like it did in all asset classes, right? It was really challenging to get anything approved 2020, 2021, and then they're working through a backlog. So I think we're back to normal delivery or our expectation is normal delivery of new supply in 2023. The thing I would think about as an investor is, you know, when you think about our biggest risk as as investing in storage, it's the market dynamics, not necessarily kind of the macro changes. But what we think about the most is the supply in the market, you know, currently, 
And what you have to think about with storage is different than multifamily. It is a very micro market game. So all we care about is, you know, it used to be the one, three and five mile radius around the facility. Now we look at drive times because Mm -hmm. remember, Whitney, storage is a metal box on a cement pad. People aren't going to travel for it, right? There's no amenities. There's no school district. If it's not convenient to work or home, you're not going to that storage facility because there's another one five miles down the road and you can go to that one. So in our world, what we're really interested in is current supply in the market. And then understanding who our addressable tenant base is. And we're looking at the same thing everybody is, right? The the traditional demographics, population growth, you know, for us, traffic count really matters, income growth, those types of things. But what if you said, hey, Chris, what's the one statistic that you would look at and you had to make a decision on the market would be occupancy, right? So I would want to know in the competitive set in my, let's say, 10 minute, 15 minute drive time in some markets, what's the occupancy on those units? And if everybody's 95% full, the demand looks pretty good. You know, if everybody's 82% full and there's three new facilities coming to the market, right? And they're all going to drop prices to get filled up. Eh, that's probably not a market we want to be a part of. So, you know, I think for us that that market look, the critical component is is truly understanding the story of that particular market. And, you know, occupancy of, of the competitive set is one of the biggest. Yeah. How, how would you say you go about learning the occupancy of the, of your competitors in a market like that? We call the competitors and ask how full they are. <laughs> <laughs> Our acquisitions team, we've tried all kinds of software. There, there's groups like Yardi and CoStar, Green Street that have put out data. Um, but what we've found is the most accurate data is literally, you know, shoe leather, right? Our, our market managers in the space will go and visit the sites and our acquisitions team will say, hey, here, there's 10 sites we want you to go visit, you know, go see if you can find out the occupancy. Most of the time we can get it. Sometimes like the publicly traded REITs aren't too keen in sharing their data, but it depends how good the person walking through the door is on schmoozing the, the lady or guy behind the desk. Sometimes it's simpler than we think, right? We make things too complicated. We can just go and ask. Yeah, that's funny. Sure. Well, you know, speak to some ways that, you know, I think about this as an investor too. If I'm thinking about an operator, I'm thinking about in- investing with, I want to know that they're, you know, maximizing the return on investment. Right. Uh, and maybe you can speak to some ways or specific ways or given even a, a deal example on how uh, Reliant has done that, you know, maybe at a recent facility uh, for, for your investors. You know, I, I think, Whitney, and you know this, too. I'm sure many of your listeners do. The, the first choice is, do I want to be a direct or passive investor? Right. I mean, if you want to go out and buy yourself your own storage facility, you know, there's there's a lot of education out there that, that you can take advantage of. If you're talking about coming in and and as a passive investor, understanding how groups like Reliant and, and there's other you know groups syndicating self-storage deals, how they bring value. Our particular model is, think of it this way, Whitney, our job is to grow net operating income, right? All of the things being equal, if we can grow NOI, then we win, right? Today, if my NOI is 100 bucks today and five years from now, it's 200 bucks, let's not factor in any cap rate differences. My property's worth more money and, and we're winning. So our job is to figure out how to grow net operating income. The biggest lever we have to pull that is expansion. So we're buying existing assets and then doing something generally, you know, building out another, let's say 10, 20,000 square feet. And so we're adding new units and then we're trying to get those new units leased up. And if we can get new units leased up, we're adding NOI to the model. So, you know, a specific example, we're building a property in Kissimmee, Florida, just outside of Atlanta. You know, we bought the facility. It was built in 2019. The gentleman filled it up, leased it up very quickly, did really well, leased up to like 85% in, in just under two years, which in storage is, is a really quick lease up. And our business plan is we built or we're building like a Lego piece that basically fits on the back, a 30,000 square foot expansion. And so now we're adding all these new units to the Unimix. And if we can get those leased up successfully, we're growing NOI the property theoretically is going to be worth money. That's our biggest lever in kind of the value add play. Uh, We have some ancillary income item things like adding U-Haul truck rental, tenant insurance, you know, retail items, box locks, that kind of stuff. And then overall management. Many times when we take over a mom and pop owned facility, there's a lot of low hanging fruit in just raising rents, right? Charging late fees, admin fees. You know, I can't tell you how many times we've gone to a facility and the owner is proud that they haven't raised rents on ter- current tenants. And, and I'm not saying it's a good or bad thing. It's just, 
you know, it's not market, right? They're happy with the occupancy that the current owner's happy with the checks they're getting. And, you know, when you plug in a, a professional management platform to it, there, there's some juice to squeeze. So I think all those things is generally what we look at as far as building a business plan uh, for a specific asset. Yeah, I love that. Well, in that, you know, that hey, all these things matter as far as uh, the U-Haul or all the things you can sell within the locks and the blankets and, the, you know, all those things that, that they help your NOI. But the biggest bang for your investment is going to be a place to expand. Uh, and add more units. Uh, and so that, that's interesting to think through. How many, you, know, you talk about the mom and pop still owning many of these facilities. I just wonder, uh, you know, as far as, you know, I would imagine you all are looking for larger facilities, right, than, uh, than most mom and pops would have. But is that inaccurate? You know, are there many mom and pops that would own a 100, 200 unit facility? Yeah. So in, in our world, the unit size is probably a little bit higher, right? So our, our average facility is just under 70,000 square feet, which, you know, generally is 50 to 70,000 net rentable square feet. The answer to your question is yes, there's still a lot of mom and pop owned facilities that, you know, kind of fit into our acquisition model. Generally, Reliant because our overhead is too high for anything smaller, you know, we're not buying anything I would say less than 40,000 square feet unless there's a substantial expansion opportunity uh, to be had with it. And and many times Whitney, I mean just think of you know, it's generational, right? They've been building these facilities for years. I'll give you a great example. We bought a property in Lutz, Florida, just outside of Tampa, where the guy and his brother bought it in 1994. They built the initial section, they leased it up, they refinanced, so they had cash. They built another section, they leased it up, had cash, refinanced. They did that three or four times. They ended up with, a, I don't know, 75,000 square foot facility in a great market. So we see a lot of that from the mom and pop operators where they're just, you know, building as they go. And then they get to a point where someone's offered them a check that they're like, okay, if you're going to pay me that, I'll get out. Yeah, since 94. Wow. I would imagine they were willing uh, by that point. Uh, I would imagine too that, uh, you know, you all are able to come in and provide such better management alone, much less even an expansion uh, that would increase the value or the NOI. So that particular property is one of those stories where when we we went to do our due diligence, just a quick aside. So we went to do our due diligence on that property. and. Let's let's take a specific unit type. So 10 by 10, we had 20, well, just over 20 different prices for a 10 by 10. And we're like, what are you guys doing here? Like, what is this? And they said, oh, well, we don't charge more rent for people who've been with us. We just change the rate each year for the next people. So Whitney, if you had rented in 1994 and still had your unit, you're still paying the same rate. And if I had rented in 2014, <laughs> I'm paying a different rate. So, you know, we looked at that and said, okay, so, you know, we're going to upset some people, right? That's we're underwriting part of that occupancy drop because we know when we go in and bring everybody up to market rates, it's going to upset some people and they're probably going to leave. But in, in those kind of scenarios, we just kind of salivate. We're like, that sounds great. We'd, we'd love to take over this facility because to your <laughs> point, there's just, it's just low hanging fruit. And, and if anybody goes anywhere else in the market, they're going to pay market rates. So yeah, it, it provides a good opportunity for us. Yeah. Well, they've enjoyed that for 30 years. They can. <laughs> yeah. It's time. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, you know, let's speak to uh, exit strategies a little bit and think through, you know, if I'm looking at the operator, thinking about this deal I'm going to invest in, what are some exit strategies the investor should be considering, you know, thinking long term, right? Thinking four or five, seven years from now, or maybe elaborate on your all's business plan a little bit, but then what the exit strategy normally is. Yeah. So so for us, historically, we've taken uh, just over 60 deals full cycle. And almost all of them, Whitney, have been to institutional capital or the publicly traded REITs, right? So think of us as kind of like a real estate investment trust's middleman. They're not going to take the time to go out and build a 15,000 square foot expansion, but they'll buy it from us once it's done. So we'll go into a market, you know, we'll, we'll do the expansion, institutionalize the property, and then there's an appetite from the REITs to, to potentially buy that asset down the road. So we've done business specifically with you know CubeSmart, Extra Space, where they're buying assets from us once we execute on the business plan. Institutional capital is another route, especially in the last five years, which is large pension funds, endowments, those types of groups are trying to deploy capital in this space because it's performed so well historically. And so you know they're recapitalizing deals like ours. In, in November of 21, 
we had a group called Harrison Street Capital. They're mid-market private equity shop out of Chicago, kind of like a Blackstone, but smaller. They recapitalized 26 of our stabilized deals. So they bought out all the investors in those deals and they put it into a core fund, right? They bought it unlevered. They just wanted assets that sit on a shelf, inflation hedge forever. So, you know, as an investor, you're trusting the operator to find good opportunities for an exit. For us, it's mostly been institutional capital and the REITs that have provided those exits for us. You know, if you're trying to sell your own property, I think it depends on the size and the scale at which you're operating. Because, you know, certainly generally the larger investors need to write bigger checks to make it make sense for them. So if you have a smaller facility, you know, maybe you're selling to another investor like us, you know, who's coming in and buying and and going to grow that that property. So I think it depends on the situation you're in. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know, I want to shift gears just a little bit with a few minutes we have left. And because I know you are an expert in this portion of the business, uh, as far as, you know, connecting with investors, I get this question all the time. You know, they want to know, like, what's the best source for meeting new investors right now, uh, you know, for us? And I, I wonder that for you uh, also, because I know that's a that's a big part, you know, where you lead in the business and, and caring for your investors. But what is your best source for meeting new investors right now? Yeah, it's a, a fair question. We we do a lot of digital, Whitney. We, we've we've been toying with the last year of building out, you know, Facebook, Instagram ads, things that that are driving leads to us. For us, that's probably the best volume that we have of of new investors, people who are interested in deploying capital in the space. It's been a really interesting journey for us. I, I feel like we've spend enough money, enough time to be relatively educated on how to do it. And, you know, it's it's an interesting market and, and just allows for scale. And I realize that's not available for everybody. I, the thing I would say from an investor standpoint is, you know, depending on where you are in your timeline, right? If, if you're just getting started with your first syndicated deals, I mean, you're going to family and friends, right? The people who trust you as an operator, they're going to be the people who write you a check. When you have a little bit of an established track record, then you can start to expand a little bit. You know, what we try to do is we know what our avatar is for an investor, right? Generally, we know our investor kind of fits in this box. And generally, we're trying to put ourselves in places where those investors are. So whether that be, you know, conference piece, what I would say is we try really hard not to go to places where everyone is asking for money. That usually helps, right? If if there's 50 guys that are asking for money, that is you're you're a very small fish in a big pond. You know, we we try to go to places. I'll give you an example. We did a plastic surgery conference here in Buckhead, Georgia. You know, we're the only vendor there who's talking about passive real estate investment. And we sponsor lunch, those kinds of things. But you know, we're surrounded by medical device vendors, so we stand out. And I think that's our goal, Whitney. Whenever we try to get in front of investors, is you know, we're trying to do something that we're the odd man out. People are like, oh, why are you guys here? Yeah, makes you stand out for sure. That makes so much sense. I, I, I have also, uh, we've tried to do that internally at LifeBridge as well, but I push others, hey, think about places where everybody else is not going, right? As far as real estate guys uh, that, that are looking for investors. Uh, I think that's such a great point. Uh, What's working you know, for you guys? What are some of the things that are work? Yeah, you know, for us, uh, we've we've been, I think, later to, really to get into doing ads and things like that on Facebook and, and Google. And we've not invested a lot there. We've started doing a little bit of that. Uh, but the biggest thing for me has also been conferences and me personally uh, speaking at conferences. Uh, that has probably been the biggest driver. The podcast has helped a ton, but you know, it's been probably the biggest thing or the fastest thing has been me going to conferences and shaking hands and talking to people, right? You know, and then it's the follow-up, right? And then it's the follow-up and the phone calls uh, that I think have helped us to, you know, bring investors on and obviously increase their investment and just building that relationship, you know, and so, you know, it's obviously a lot more time involved, but uh, I do think that, you know, me going to places has helped a lot. You know, we're increasing that as far as other team members going as well now to some places, but still it says a lot when uh, I personally call our investors, you know, which we, which I'm trying to do more and more, you know, but it, even that has helped increase our investments or even asking for referrals, uh, you know, and, and sometimes, uh, they know a ton of people that are in that network, just like you're talking about. But until you ask for it, sometimes they don't, you know, even think about, you know, bringing other people with them. But yes, for us, it's been me going to conferences more than anything. I wanted to ask you, you know, as we are thinking about, you know, right now the the economy, a lot of people worried about some potential downturn or or the downturn that we're in or go or headed into. However, that you want to think about it, you know, as you're as a passive investor is thinking about somebody like Reliant. 
how do they know you all are prepared for a downturn? How does that look like for you, Chris? Uh, you know, or or maybe you can help the investor that's listening think through. Hey, I, I like self storage, but how do I know they're ready for the, a potential downturn or the downturn they that they believe we're in? You don't. You don't know. I mean, look, the the, the challenging part with passive investing is there's so much that if you're dealing with a unscrupulous operator, there's so much that can be hidden, right? What I talk about, Whitney, and this is how I've, inv- I've I've done a fair amount of passive investing in 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 my career, and what I bet on is is team and track record, right? I, I want to know the people first, because generally, if you have great people, right, and I'm not saying great investors, I'm saying great humans, that's a that's a good place to start, right? When things go downhill, you know those people are going to act on your behalf, um, and so you know in real estate, stuff goes up and down, um, and I, for me, I like to know the people are great. And if that happens and they have a great track record, that's a pretty good indicator. And and look, you can do as much due diligence on the underwriting as you like. But I can tell you, our pro forma is on version 14 with like 14 <laughs> tabs on it, right? That's so right. <laughs> if we if we want to be sneaky in how our pro forma is set up, we can. Like, you're never going to find those things, right? So I think, you know, team and track record is just where you can start. And then, and then do normal due diligence items, right? Google people, right? Ask for referrals. Like those are the things that people are, I, I'm shocked, Whitney, some of our investors who write checks to us and I'm like, you know, really? Like you're not going to ask anything else? And look, that's, that it benefits us, but I just kind of think on the back end, not all of the people that are out there are reliance. <laughs> so, you know, I, I would be really cautious about, basing investment decisions on projected returns. Projected returns are all made up. It is an Excel spreadsheet and they are based on assumptions. And if you want the returns to up, you just change the assumption and now my return is higher. So you really got to be careful on that piece. And, you know, Whitney, from the downturn standpoint, I think you also got to look at the asset class, right? How is the asset class performed in previous economic downturns? And in self-storage, self-storage outperformed all other major asset classes in 2007, 8, and 9, and in COVID, 21 and 22. Well, 20 and 21 for us were a year and a half of the best in our asset classes history, right? Reliant included, but we had an incredible 2021. Occupancy was off the charts. Rent growth was off the charts. Now, it's not going to be like that forever, and it isn't. It's coming back to the median now, but historically, look at how the asset class has done in a downturn. Now, all that being said, and Whitney, you know this too, right? Like if you're a hotel operator and COVID happens, what do you do? You know, it's hard to run a business when there's no revenue. Office, the same thing, right? Now right. you're an office operator and and it, what what are you doing? Are you buying? Is, is, this, is it going to come back? Don't know those questions, right? So, you know, there's always those black swan events that kind of kick you in the teeth. And and that's where the great people come in. Like, hey, are they going to make good decisions on your behalf? Because because stuff happens. Yeah. No, I think that's wise and and real. <laughs> you know, it's the relationship with the operator. Man, are you know, are are these people going to do what they say they're going to do and do the best for me when stuff hits the fan? Because it's going to, right? Or mo- more times than not over the life cycle of a project, there's unexpected things that happen, right? Uh, I mean, it's just part of the business, uh, and I, so I, I love how you just went back to the the relationship with the operator. So I, I agree. I believe. And Whitney, think is of key. think of like Bernie Madoff, right? The yeah, some of the largest institutional investors in the world. These are the smartest minds in the game, right? For thirty years, he was fooling them, right? So that's what I mean. Like you're you're not going to find like a thing. I, I'm not saying don't do it, but in a pro forma, you're not going to be like aha. You know, like <laughs> guys, guys who want to be dirtbags are going to be able to be dirtbags. And, and you just think of these massive Ponzi schemes that have fooled hundreds and thousands of people for tens, 20 years. He's just a bad person, right? Like, yeah, those, that's kind of the, the thing that you always kind of have to lean into. So I don't mean to soapbox you on that, but that's kind of what we talk with investors all the time. It's like, look, find great people. And, yeah. If they've done well, generally, it's probably going to be okay. Yeah. No, I, I get the question all the time. Uh, and I, it's why I like asking people like yourself. They're very experienced in this space. And I would say this 
very similar thing. I mean, it's all about the relationship with the operator long before you ever look at the deal or the underwriting. Um, so I could not agree more. I wanted to go back to your question for me a minute ago. I thought of one other thing that we're, we've started doing. I wanted to share with you and the listeners, and, and that's uh, investor dinners. Uh, and so, you know, we've started doing, uh, you know, at a very nice place, we'll host an event. Uh, and so, and, but a key part of that is letting them invite their friends, right? Or asking them, hey, bring a friend with you and their spouse you know, as well. So, hey, when you can get the spouse on board for investing in your deal or the spouse comes to know you, uh, it's it's a big deal, right? It's not then just this one investor by themselves making this. I mean, when you can have the, you know, as a couple, you know, investing in your deal and, and loving your company and the partnership, it goes a long way. Anyway, I just wanted to share Wait, that with you. you. Just, are you just going city to city, kind of like nationwide tour based on where your investors are? We are, yeah, based on where they're at. And so if we have a, you know, dozen, 15 or 20 in one place, you know, we'll host an event and, and let them bring their friends and, and spouses. And so we try to keep it, you know, we don't, we don't want it to be a conference, you know, we want it to be pretty intimate and, and small. And so uh, we try to have, you know, round tables. And so everybody can see each other and talk. And then, uh, you know, somebody from the team, myself or my business partner or investor relations specialist will do a, maybe a 12 minute, 10, 12 minute presentation, uh, just about LifeBridge and in the economy or outlook, things like that. Uh, and then uh, let people ask questions, but then just enjoy a meal together, right? It goes back to that relationship component, just like you were referring to earlier. Well, Chris, I mean, incredible update just on self-storage and Reliant. And I just, I love the hammering at home for our past investors as well, you know, as far as the relationship for the operators and some things they need to be considering and and, uh, you know, the return on investment, some things, maybe you know, the expansion piece that, uh, you know, as I look at operators, uh, you know, I want to know those things, right? And especially, you know, as I diversify as a passive investor as well uh, with different operators, I, I want to know those pieces that, hey, who's pushing where and, you know, has that upper hand as far as finding the mom and pop like you're talking about uh, that can that can do those things and operate well and take care of me uh, as an operator. Uh, one more question, Chris, uh, tell us how you like to give back. Yeah, for me personally, there's there's a couple things. So we have a, I sit on a board. We, we've had some struggles with our teenage son, kind of substance abuse, mental health type stuff. I live in Roswell, Georgia, just north of Atlanta. And there's a group here that's been an incredible resource for us as a family. I sit on the board there on, on their non-for-profit arm. It's a group called Eternal Strength, which is an incredible uh, they, they just do great work. So spend time there. And there's also North Fulton Charities here in the, the Roswell area that has like a, a soup kitchen or, you know, a, a food pantry and a thrift store that um, both my wife and I volunteer at um, as much as we can. So, yeah, look, we're, we're, we're grateful to have been blessed with a lot. And in my opinion, you know, as you create more and more wealth, your, your job is to find ways to, uh, to impact others. So as much as we can, we will. Yeah, I appreciate that, Chris. Just your outlook on giving back as well, and no doubt we've been blessed a lot uh, with a lot, and and want to help others uh, to grow as well. Chris, thank you so much for your you know, way you've given back to us today and being willing to share about your path and and reliant and self storage industry. You know the current economic climate. Thank you so much. Uh, tell the listeners how they can get in touch with you and learn more about you. Yeah, for sure. Best place to start with us is our website. It's uh, reliant-mgmt.com. So like the abbreviation of management, you know, we LinkedIn, if you search me on LinkedIn, you'll find that the, the website's best bet to find more information on us, team track record, you know, strategy, those types of things. And if, if you want to touch base with our investor relations team, there's, there's all kinds of ways for you to get in touch with us there. So uh, happy to do it. Thank you for being with us again today. I hope that you have learned a lot from the show. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I hope you're telling your friends about the Real Estate Syndication Show and how they can also build wealth in real estate. You can also go to lifebridgecapital.com and start investing today.